production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, exploring the prominent role women played in the history of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra, local author and educator Carlotta Penn hopes young children of color can see and celebrate themselves in her picture books, an artist gets physical with her abstract canvases, and beautiful harmonies from a pair of brothers who call themselves Ingram Street. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm David Holm, your host for this episode of Broad and High. Columbus women played a big role in the Columbus Little Orchestra. That was the predecessor to today's Columbus Symphony Orchestra. Historian Doreen Uhouse Sauer shows us how women answered the call and helped save Columbus's symphony. I am so privileged to be able to interview the two of you because today we're talking about an organization that saved an organization. And I'm wondering if I could start with you, Sandy, to just talk about what the organization is we're talking about. Well, we're talking about the women who were involved in creating and have been supporting the Columbus Symphony, its current name, for 70 years, which is an amazing thought that here we are and we're sitting in an archive that has really documented what happened from the beginning and how it has grown and how much it's meant to people. Uh, Therese, can you give a little bit more detail about the beginning of the orchestra and the importance of it? It was founded pretty much standardly by city fathers right. around 1941 and it was more or less birthed full-grown. They started an orchestra with professional musicians and they hired a first-class conductor, Eisler Solomon, and then it garnered the support of the Women's Association of the Philharmonic, they were known then, who would try to raise money through various means and support them. I guess in looking through the many scrapbooks that have been out, and this is just a fraction of them, it's very easy to see that there are luncheons and there are lots of people with hats and gloves on, the required fashion mode of the day. And that sort of led perhaps to what Sandy is kind of in front of you, and it's about using historic themes and fashion shows. So clearly there have been a lot of fashion shows that were used to unite different symphony units and have a program that they all could enjoy together. And certainly music was a part of them without any question. And in fact, in our particular unit, we would sponsor an annual luncheon where we would have uh, some of the symphony members and their students play for us, but then there would be a fashion show. And we also would have a silent auction so that we could be raising money that we could give to the symphony. So it was always sort of a combination, mm -hmm. but there have been so many other fundraising events that didn't involve the hats and gloves. The lectures of note were sponsored by the Women's Association of the Columbus Symphony. It was held in the Ohio Theater and there was a series and you could buy a season subscription to them and they would bring in celebrities and have them talk about all kinds of things. I mean, for example, here's Ray Bolger talked about his world. Celeste Holm, just ask me. But then also here's Thomas Hoving talking about the tomb of Tutankhamun. So it was a real variety. A, really sm a smorgasbord. Yes. And they were sellouts. And we had lots of other ways that women could be involved, but could involve the rest of the community as well. We also have like this little booklet here, which is about the Canterbury unit. What can you tell us about the units and 
their organization, and what would have been their role in a season of the orchestra or preceding it? Well, I think the units were really a wonderful way for a very extensive organization to have some smaller groups that played a role in carrying out the mission of the Women's Association. And I think that in that smaller group, people could come up with ideas, but they all then could join their ideas and work together on all kinds of projects for fundraising and the volunteerism has been extensive through the years. They were so active that when the Philharmonic disbanded, they insisted on staying together. In 1949, they were running a deficit. They had not been able to make ends meet. So at that point, the city fathers got together, the board members, and said, we're not gonna be throwing any more money at this, but we will pay your debts, and you have to disband. The Women's Association of the Philharmonic said, oh no, we won't go. <laughs> and so they stayed. And for the years of 49, 50, and early 51, they were continuing to have card parties, fashion shows, all the ways that they raised money, but they were donating it towards scholarships for music students. Then George Hardesty and a, and a group of the administration decided they could swing a small orchestra. It wasn't going to be the Philharmonic, it wasn't going to be a professional orchestra, but it was going to be a professional orchestra so much as they would be union rate musicians, but they wouldn't be have full-time salaries. So that was how the Columbus Little Symphony was formed. And then there had been a grant from Battelle that was a large sum of money around 1978, I think. And that made them decide to be able to have more full-timers. From that point on, we were a professional orchestra again after a lapse of maybe 40, 50 years. But by the time of, we had reached the year 2000, gradually and incrementally, the orchestra that had been, had been recreated as a full-time professional orchestra. One of the things I noticed in going through scrapbooks, and I think I was only four pages into looking, were the number of women who were so well-known, and they are still well-known. And I'm thinking, you know, there was Eleanor Gelby, there was Mary Bishop, who later actually saves the Ohio Theater to a great extent. Not just saving the orchestra now, now we're talking about the saving the home yes. for an orchestra. When it became apparent that the Columbus Symphony at Veterans Memorial wasn't going to continue, but at the same time, the Ohio Theater was in danger of being raised. It took a lot of effort, but it turned out with a wonderful outcome that the women and men came together and really worked hard to save the Ohio Theater. But there, were, there was a big push from the women to make sure that happened. In looking back at all of this, what do you think are the legacies of all of this history and the importance of this group to where we are today and where we're the symphony hopes to be in the future. I do think that uh, in many ways, the Columbus Symphony may have a unique origin story because generally most of these um, orchestras were begun by civic-minded city leaders who wanted to have this cultural thing for their community, in, often in the way of status. And this orchestra was begun because women dug their heels in and decided, no, the men have failed. We are going to pick it up. We're going to start small and we're going to build it. There's something about women in, in that day and there is a persistence. Tenacious. <laughs> yes, a tenacious quality of, we want this not for the accolades and not for the glory, but for our children. We want this for a legacy for our city. Very well put. The legacy really is embodied in all of this. You know, music is the heart of so many of people's lives. And now it's really come to mean so much for the whole community to have the kind of variety we have. We have young people's concerts, we have 
classical music series. We have Picnic at the Pops, and it's a real community gem, a community asset, and we all are the beneficiaries of the history that these women really promoted from the beginning. Columbus author and educator Carlotta Penn was frustrated by the lack of diversity in children's literature. So she did something about it and wrote not one, but two books for kids. The latest is called The Turtle with an Afro, and it encourages young black girls to love and embrace the versatility of their hair. Here's her story. Turtle was frustrated. It was a bad hair day. Her springy, sprightly curls absolutely, positively would not stay in place. I think it's very interesting and very telling when, when I think about culture and black culture and African-American culture and then African-American women's culture, even though African-American and African-American women are diverse. Um, there are still so many things that tie us together and one of those things is the hair experience. They refused to obey the brush or the comb. They did not care how loud she screamed or how long she moaned. They were fantastic, fabulous, frolicking and feisty. Why, oh why, Turtle asked, won't you just be nice to me? You know, my relationship with my own hair is a, is a daily experience. Um, and I don't know that that is not an experience that is had in other communities, but I know that the way that we talk about our hair um, is unique to our community. And so for me, the story is not about, it's not a conversation with mainstream about whether or not the hair is okay, which I think has been done in books. Where I think The Turtle with an Afro is different is that it's, a, it's more of an internal conversation with people who have curly hair, who we know we get frustrated with it. We want our curly hair. I, you know, it's not about me wanting my hair to be straight. I just want it to do what I want it to do and it doesn't do the same thing every day. Um, or it takes time and that's frustrating. But those crazy curls had extravagant plans to dance and jump and bounce all over her head. Shimmy, 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 slip, slide, twirl. Shake, shake, shake it out. Whirl, whirl, whirl. I like when stories, you know, are poetry and our song. And kids love poetry and song. Rainbow, blue skies, open up your... I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. We grew up on the east side of Columbus. My love of books started with my mother. She read a lot to us when we were younger. And so just the typical like reading stories at bedtime and my parents were really big on instilling in us just the beauty of black culture and African culture. When I got a little bit older is when I can remember books with black characters. Turtle watched them twist and turn, full of shimmer and shine. A thousand works of art, she thought, and each one is mine. So today I have a husband and two children, and I'm an educator and a writer. I got my master's degree in comparative studies where I studied um, African-American women and uh, thinking about race and the influence of uh, colorism in African-American women. Um, and eventually went on to get my doctorate in education where my focus was multicultural um, and equity studies. And so what I think the through line through all of that is just thinking about people and diversity and our stories and how they matter to the lives that we live. She whipped her head around and around, jumped back, forth, up and down. Styling and profiling with her lovely locks, Turtle was ready to rock. 
And I'm not an artist. My father was an artist. Uh, my brother's an artist. I didn't get the art gene. It was important for me for the illustrator to be a black woman. And so I, I found her on Instagram. I went through and found some um, posts about black women illustrators. We, bo we both talked about uh, being sensitive to the topic of uh, of hair and the idea that this turtle was having a bad hair day, how that could potentially come off as seeing curly hair as negative. And so really being intentional through the story and pictures to convey that it's not the hair that was bad. Everybody has bad hair days, but this is a story about, you know, a turtle who's just negotiating her love for her hair. So just like that, turtle saw the light. Her curls were absolutely, positively, dynamite. When there are times when I feel like frustrations with just being an independent publisher and you know the struggles of knowing that I feel like I have a good story and I want the exposure you know you get those those voices in your head and then I hear back from people who are like this this story matters my kids like this story it's important and it drives you to go ahead and keep putting those stories out there because people people want them and appreciate them and um, their lives are changed by stories, just like my life was changed by stories. So it matters. Flow fierce and fly free, Turtle said. And look at that afro, a crown on her head. Artist Susan Handow's canvases are of a minimalistic nature. With color and texture, she creates abstract shapes surrounded by neutral hues. We head to Reno, Nevada for her story. My name is Susan Handow and I'm an abstract artist. I work in mixed media. I do acrylic, uh, oil, sometimes wax. I put gypsum, mix it with glue for texture, and sometimes I cut up paintings and sew them back together. I do color blocking. It's just blocks of color that are scratched away. It's an organic kind of shape. It's not like a square anymore. I've been chipping away at it scratching away at it, and then I'll do the border or the background in a neutral color. Can't really say, well, that's a, a tree or something, or that's like a, even like a box or something. Y you kind of say, oh, it almost looks like this, but no, it's not. When I start a painting, all I know is that I'm going to do color blocking. And really, I do a layer of colors upon colors. And then I put the gypsum in. I call it mud. You know, it's not really mud, but I just put the mud down there to build the texture up. And then you can see that it cracks a lot. It dries, and then I start putting a different color on there and push the color around in the cracks. Then I'll paint another color over top of it, and then the one color will stay in the crack, and then I really scrape it. I start scraping and marking, and that's where the fun comes in. Because then you get different layers that, that pop out. So that's my canvases. So with my paper, that's a whole different story. With my paper, I'll put a little texture on there, and then I'll do the same kind of thing with the paint, the color blocking. And then when I get it just so, just how I like it, then I cut it up. I actually cut the paper. And then I sew it onto another piece of paper. And then I'll just see how it goes. And I don't really ever have anything planned. Color to me is pretty important. When I'm mixing colors to find an unusual color, bizarre color combinations or or ones that really you don't expect to see together. And then, of course, shape. I really like to cut away at an image to make it really more organic. If it's not right in my mind, I, I can't show it. 
just keep working on it till it, it's right for me. Even then, after a show, if a painting doesn't feel right, I'll change it. I'll paint over it. I've painted over so many paintings. This one here behind me, that's like, uh, there might be two th or three paintings under that one. I really like beautiful things and that's like my goal is to, for myself to really like it. Then I'm so proud of it because I love it so much. When somebody buys my painting, I'm like, oh my gosh, they, they feel the same way I feel. It's not the money thing, it's, it's the fact that, that, wow, somebody really likes what I like. That's what makes me feel good. It's always been that way. Woody and Minguel Ingram grew up singing for school talent shows and regional showcases. They're continuing their music journey as Ingram Street, a Columbus-based R&B brother duo dishing out smooth vocals and catchy verses. Joining them is Wib Schneider on guitar. Enjoy the music of Ingram Street. time so many expectations and unseen revelations anxious anticipating oh yes i've been here waiting to figure out this love and difference grew between me and you baby being with you is beautiful holding you is beautiful is there a possibility for us baby touching you is beautiful kissing you is beautiful is there a possibility for love this is a simple question the answer relieves no guessing a little trepidation my heart just needs some confirmation i'll find a trillion reasons our love will last for all season winter i fall for you the whole spring and summer through baby being with you is beautiful holding you is beautiful is there a possibility for us baby touching you is beautiful kissing you is beautiful is there a possibility for us From the moment that we met, I've only had eyes for you. I think about you morning and noon, and every single night. And the thoughts that go through my mind 
about me and you that beautiful so is there a possibility for me and you check this out baby being with you is beautiful being with you, oh, with you, you is beautiful thanks for being with us for this edition of broad and high you can find all of our stories online at wsu.org as well as on our free wsu mobile app We'll be back next week with more stories about Columbus arts and artists. There a possibility for love. No second guessing, baby. Been heavy on my mind lately. This feeling, it drives me crazy. Gotta know what you want to do. You, so real is this feeling. You are willing to make my fantasy come true. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. A possibility for us. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you.